Welcome to episode 229, How to Live in Alignment with Diamandia Lingos. Welcome to the Be That 1% podcast. I'm your host, James Silvis, mindset specialist and performance coach. And here on the show, I'm going to challenge you to think deeper, commit to greatness, and develop a stronger mindset. You'll hear stories from those who are living life on their terms, and you'll receive strategies that will help you level up. So the question is, are you ready to be your own 1%? Let's get started. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Be That 1% podcast. Today, coming at us from all the way in Rhode Island, uh, Diamandia Lingos, who has been on the podcast many, many times, uh, two to be exact, part one, part two, first time I've ever done a part one and part two. Uh, That was back in April 2020. And if you have not yet listened to those episodes, please just do yourself a favor, go back listen, grab a notebook and, and just listen to this story. Um, so powerful, so profound, so much wisdom in it, so much strength, resilience, all these things. Uh, above all that though, is the individual who went through it. And that is Diamandia. And she has become such a dear friend to me, soul tribe. Uh, we've gone deep on many, many occasions. It seems like every conversation we have is a podcast episode. And so we made it, we made a pact that every time we talk, we have to record it in the event that we want to turn it into an episode. So this is the first conversation since that inception. Uh, and who better to bring back than someone who is constantly leveling up, uh, who is inspiring me in many ways and, and also is super dear to my heart. So Diamandia, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It is an honor. Yes. So uh, we talked a little bit last conversation and offline a bit here before we jumped on about alignment and the things that we wanted to touch on today, really stemming into how to know what is in alignment and then how to just act from that place and live from that place. And that's ultimately, I, t- according to you, which I'll let you talk about, is what's been building in your life and, and what's been attributing to the massive success that you've had uh, since we've talked last, but really in the last six to eight months. So let's start with alignment as a definition, just so everyone listening understands how you think about it so that they have a reference point and then we can pull on some threads from there. So alignment uh, for me means to really be clear on what your purpose is, uh, how you want to show up in this world, and then being true to showing up as that person. Mm -hmm. Um, And alignment can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different areas. But when it comes to what we're talking about, it's like how you want to work, what you want to work on, how you want to show up, and who you want to be in that process. Mm -hmm. And when did this click for you, this uh, idea of living in alignment? Maybe it's always been a thing, or maybe it's more so recently. When did it finally snap into place? And you're like, I am living from here. And I I know that that's going to bring about some challenge. It's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. It's going to cause me to prune a lot of relationships and Mm -hmm. even say no to a lot of potential opportunities. Uh, When did that snap in? And and, um, what have been some examples of you doing that? It really happened for me, like right around when we did our first episode. Mm. Um, that was March, 2020, right around then. Yeah, March, April. Um, so it was after I came back from my first trip from Peru. Um, I had gone into a couple leadership programs and then COVID hit. And so, you know, I had come from a lifestyle where I was like, running and going and running and pushing and running and pushing and pushing and running. And I was forced to stay still. And I was also in this position with work that I was making money in my job. I was successful in my job, but I was like pushing and it was really starting to feel like heavier. And I was, it felt like I was like dragging people across the finish line. And I was like, 
I was like, it was emotionally exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, which a lot of consulting work is because you're doing something that someone's afraid to do or they don't want to do. So you, it's a lot of convincing, then they become aligned and then you get there, but there's a lot of like heavy lifting. And when I went to Peru and came back and we talked, it was really clear to me what I wanted to do with my career. Like I wanted to start a real estate investment company and I was going to be getting on stages to speak about trauma to help others. And that was like the two lanes were like, this is exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it, and it was out of chaos because I didn't know, like, I just knew it was, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And I knew it wasn't fun. I knew what I was doing wasn't fulfilling to me, you know, but I was making money. And it was like, why would I break something that supposedly was working, but it wasn't giving me any satisfaction. And then I had this thing that I had been hiding from for so long and trying to pretend like it didn't happen and heal from and try to get back to where I was before it happened. And I really didn't realize that what I was never getting back to who I was before it happened because I was never going to be that person again. I was going to be forever changed. And I had to be really clear in that moment coming out of that, like kind of that like chaos -y mush, I call it pureed soup. I felt like pureed soup. Um, and I was like, this is what I'm doing. And then it was the decision and it was a lot, <laughs> there was a lot of meditation involved in this. And that was something I really resisted as well. And there was one meditation that I did specifically that Melissa Woodhouse um, put out. It was a 15 minute meditation on alignment. And I did that meditation every single day. Mm -hmm. And it was aligning to your purpose. And you get to choose who you want to be and how you want to show up in this world. And part of that was a journal prompt afterwards to write down the type of person you wanted to be. And so practicing that mentally and then practicing that by the writing process to support that, it really started to like embed in me, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't a straight line. Like it, you know, it wasn't something that I was like, okay, now I'm, now I'm this person, but like, I definitely tried to go back to previous behavior. So we all do it. So it's, you know, that's, what's great about behavior. It's embedded. Uh, it's the hardest thing to change. So it kept me accountable with that meditation and it, and it kept me accountable with my community because I declared that to you. I declared that to Chelsea. I declared that to people, Brandon and, and I, and now that I was speaking it, mm -hmm. I was meditating it, I was writing it. And now I was speaking it almost in an affirmation type of space. And so I started to embody it. When you were writing it, did you write the same thing over and over? Uh, no, but I would go through cycles where I would write, like, I have a specific list of affirmations that I write every day, no matter what I am open and ready to receive all the love and abundance the universe has to offer me. I am healthy. I'm safe. I'm enough. Like those happen every day, no matter what, mm -hmm. but with the journal prompts, it was similar, similar writing, similar mm -hmm. person. And it changed because I changed as I became that person. When you wrote those, when you write those, sim those ones that are the same every day, how do you, or do you ensure that the emotion behind that writing is there or is it more so just the repetition of it? Like, I imagine that if you're writing those same things after a while, they don't mean as much as they did when maybe you first started writing, or maybe they mean more, maybe they mean less. How do you manage the emotion behind the writing if you do it all? It, it depends on where I am. You know, if I'm having a really hard day, sometimes that's an emotional process. If I'm having a day where I'm really calm and grounded, like that's an emotionless process. And it really has become about embodying that and, you know, ways of being. And I didn't even understand what ways of being was. I was such a doer. You know, I, I could do anything. I could get a checkbox completed. I could like handle all tasks. And what I started learning by, by embodying things 
these affirmations by embodying who I was becoming, I started radiating this energy. And this is, these are things that I never believed before. Um, I started embodying this, this energy and it just started attracting people. Mm-hmm. And it just started attracting people who were living and vibrating in this space already. And they mm-hmm. started to see me. Mm-hmm. And crazy things started happening. <laughs> yeah, you got to share some of those crazy things because they are pretty crazy. But when you break down what you were doing day in and day out for two years, they're not crazy. No. Right. Um, the work builds the confidence. The confidence builds the conviction. The conviction helps the courage in which the voice comes out and you can speak into existence all that you've been thinking and, and that ultimately becomes manifestation. Yes. Um, these, uh, I don't want to say that. How do I want to ask this? Your, um, well, just tell us the stories. Tell us the, the, the two examples that are like insane and, uh, and how they came about and like how you were handling them or you're thinking about in, that, in those moments. Um, okay. <laughs> well, one of them. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, what were you going to say? I was going to say, start with the coaching one. So I decided a couple of things. I made, I made some declarations and some goals. And one of them was I was going to hire a real estate coach. Um, I wanted support with that lane that I had decided that I was going to build. And I had done all the research, um, I've read all of the Bibles or like the real estate Bibles by Joe Fairless. I researched Joe Fairless. I found out who his coach was. I like, I researched all the authors and they all pointed to this one guy. And so I, I found him and I emailed him and I tried to set up a call with him and we chatted and he was like, you know, you sound great, but you know, I've got a 50 person waiting list right now. And I was like, you're going to work with me. I I have a feeling like I'm not coming from like an egotistical standpoint. I just have this like grounded feeling that we're going to work together. And he was like, okay, well, give me some time. And he went back and he listened to our podcast, the first one. And he called me the next day and he said, you're right. You are, we're going to work together. And I'm going to bump you ahead of the 50 people that I have waiting right now. And we started working together. And we were working together for about four weeks. Um, And the the process of hiring him was really, really difficult for me. Um, I had done all of this work already. I had been in the leadership programs. You know, I had gone to Peru twice. You know, it was like, it was like happening, but it was a really expensive amount of money for me. Um, Which is funny because I had no problem spending cash on a car. (laughs) a couple of months before, cause my ego wanted the car. But when it came to the paying this high price for a coach, it was like, what's the return on investment, you know? And you know, all the ways that you try to like make excuses for betting on yourself. You know, it, it really became for me about, I couldn't hide behind another company. I couldn't hide behind a partnership. I couldn't hide behind a relationship, you know, I by spending this money, it was like, I was choosing me and it was me on me. And there was no excuses anymore. And if it didn't work, it was me. And so like that tension, it was happening subconsciously. I really wasn't aware of this until after, you know, like a month into coaching. So I, I almost like, I literally wanted to throw up when I wrote the check. Um, And so that awareness of of nausea, (laughs) (laughs) has come up for me in different areas. And I realized that when I want to throw up, it's something that I actually have to do because I'm resisting it. And it's something I need to step into. So when I wrote that check, it was like, I made subconsciously me to deal with myself that it was time to level up and there was no more excuses. And three weeks later, after working with Trevor Um, I was approached by a multimillionaire real estate developer out of Beverly Hills. We had a mutual friend. um, We had been chatting, but it was more chatting about like kind of what we're doing. And like, you know, you try to connect in real estate because you never know where your next deal is going to come from. Or he had given me a call and was like, listen, I never do this, Um, but I'm going to, I want to mentor you. And 
it's going to be a buy-in. It's going to be an amount of money that makes you want to vomit. I was like, awesome. <laughs> lately. And he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to turn you into a multimillionaire and I'm going to guarantee that within the next year, you're going to have double digit million dollars in your bank account. And within five years, it'll be a hundred million. And I was like, okay. And I, I really was like, why? You know, cause I, I needed to, again, I still needed to hear someone outside tell me again, why, what they saw in me, what they were seeing in me. And he was just like, you have it, you have all of it. And you just need someone to show you the details. And then within three weeks of signing that contract, I bought a $6.85 million property in Austin, Texas that I'm developing into a 33 plot single family home development. So yeah, within that, I, um, <laughs> I, I secured a $50 million real estate deal. Boom. Just boom. And it's, it's actually making me uncomfortable <laughs> to talk about it because <laughs> Because I can't believe it, you know, so much, so much that has occurred, you know, I've done this and, and, and I'm accepting my greatness, but it's really been hard for me to say these things out loud mm -hmm. and even say accepting my greatness, you know, because I still feel like, how did this happen? But like, I've been working my ass off for years. And now that, now that I'm in an alignment and now that I'm filled with purpose and I know exactly what I want in my entire body and every cell of my body mm -hmm. know exactly what I want and why things are just happening. So that is so beautiful. I'm so happy for you. Fear is a natural response that happens anytime you are out of what one would consider homeostasis or comfort zone. Mm -hmm. There's the you that is current, that is in alignment in the way that you describe it. And then there was, there was you that was not in alignment. How did both versions of you handle fear, right? So in the past, when you weren't aligned and you had that fear come up, what did you do? What did you think? How did you operate? And now when you have those throw up moments, which, you know, are tied to fear, what, what's the difference? Well, Previous me wouldn't follow through on the nausea response, on the fear. Like I would get oh so close and then I would self-sabotage subconsciously. By doing what? Stalling? Stalling, ignoring, not responding, uh, making excuses in my schedule, not prioritizing things. Like I am really good at being busy. And so I could be busy and not be able to do something that I, that would change my life. You know, and now it's, now there's a level of ownership. And if I really want something, I will make it happen. It doesn't matter. And now that nausea response is like, I have to do that. Like, I'm not not doing it. I need to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. And, and I even coach now and I'm like, does it make you want to vomit? Yes. Okay. We have to do that. <laughs> like, What's your vomit list? <laughs> yeah, what's your vomit list? <laughs> there you go. First session with your clients. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of nausea. Right, right. <laughs> That's so cool. And so beliefs and sabotage, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. And alignment allows you to operate in full body yeses. Yes. Um, which is so vital. And for those of you who haven't heard of that concept, or, or this is the first time that you're kind of hearing the, the, this type of language, a full body. Yes. Is, is a, uh, I could describe what it's like for me in, in the moments that I've had them. And then you could tell me about yours, but when I have an idea, like I'll give you an example of, of the 61 mile walk that I did around Las Vegas in 2018, that was one of the wildest thoughts that I'd had in the physical realm. Like, I, I had seen someone, uh, Mike Posner, do a walk around America, Forrest Gumping it. And then I was like, 
I, I would love to do something similar to that. I'm not going to walk across the country, but what else could I do? And then it just got me thinking really, really big, really expansive. I'm like, I could walk from my doorstep to the mountains here. How far is that? That's 50 something miles. Okay. Well, I'd want someone to walk with me and I don't want to walk in the mountains at night. So let me just go around the city. And that's kind of like how it started formulating. And once I found the route of, of how I would go, just basically in a whole circle around Las Vegas, it, it literally went from imagination to my body screaming, this has to be done. And I didn't need to check with anybody. I didn't need to confirm it with Amanda to see if it was okay. I didn't need to like call my friend and say, Hey, what do you think of this? It was, you're doing it. And there's been about maybe five moments that I can distinctly remember. That's one um, where it's been that crystal clear. And it, it's, it brings me to a level of stillness and, and there's zero doubt in my ability to carry it out. And it's just a matter of time before planning it and executing it, but it's going to happen. And there's yeah. that level of conviction with it. And so I walked over to Amanda and I said, I'm going to do 61 miles around the city in 24 hours. And she goes, what are you talking about? I go, I don't expect you to understand. I'm just going to do it. I too, right? Now. Yeah. I was like, I'm just going to do it. And I did it. And it was so fun. And I learned so much about myself. I raised money for charity. It was a beautiful thing, but that's what it felt like for me. Yeah. What did it feel like for you? Um, well, I think there's a, for the first time in my life, I really started trusting my gut. And like, that was a big part of like a full body. Yes. Like I trusted myself completely. And like, I knew it was the right thing. Like there was no thought process. There was no, like, like you just mentioned, like there was no, like, um, I need to, but no, the answer is already yes. Like it was like absolutely 1000%. Yes. This is going to be successful. Like there's no questions asked. There's no, it was like, mm -hmm. everything was just like, yup. Like, mm -hmm. like with this real estate deal, it was a full body. Yes. And is the biggest project I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm working with two people I just started, I just met. And it was a complete like race capital. I don't, I'll figure out like whatever is going to, it was an absolutely one, 1000% I'll sign my name on that loan right now. Do you think that those are those moments are given or do you think that we can also create those moments? I think we create those moments. And I think that, you know, the 12 steps of a manifestation, there has to be the 12th step, which is the execution. Like you actually mm -hmm. have to do the thing. Right, <laughs> like, right. When people forget about the 12th step. You know, we think that we can just, you know, say things and embody things and they're going to just jump in front of us, which they will. But if we aren't completely aligned, we'll walk right past the 12th step and mm -hmm. we won't do the thing. You know, and I think a yeah. lot of this is like, is years of work and then finally alignment. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I'm, I'm thinking about my example right now, right? The, the walk, like, was the, was that idea given to me by, let's just say God universe, uh, inspiration. And, and it's in the thought river that, you know, is, is circulating around me. And I was just clear enough and open enough for that to fall into me and, and because I've taken the time to make sure that there's clarity and foundation in my body and it's organized, I can now recognize that that idea has entered my mind and my existence, my space. And, and it's like that gift mixed with my level of preparation created that full body. Yes. Yeah. Is it, is it like that? Or can you take an idea that you're not too excited about and turn it into a full body? Yes. I think you have to be aligned with it. I, ha I think in some so it's way a, it's a hit or it's a, it's all or nothing. 
Yeah. And I think that like, from my experience, I've called things like a year before, mm-hmm. you know, like this deal, I called this a year before I was like, I'm going to be working on multi-million dollar development deals. Mm-hmm. And people were like, you're insane. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I think I'm insane or whatever you want, but it's happening. I didn't know how the how yeah. was not even important. And it's funny because I used to get so stuck in the how that mm-hmm. it would prevent me. Yes. And it's the who, it's not the how. It's who you are, who you show up as, and then who shows up for you because of how you're showing up. And like my first, this is another great one, like my first capital raise. Um, I didn't know how the hell I was going to do that. I was like questioning every single, how the heck am I going to raise two and a half million dollars? I don't have the network. I can't ask people for money. Like it was all the things, all the things that you like start with doubting. And the first amount of money that I raised, the first amount of first $250,000 I raised walked into my apartment. I swear to God, I was, I literally went on a Bumble date with someone eight months before. Didn't talk to him. He was like, he wasn't coming out of a divorce. He wasn't ready to do whatever and like no harm, no foul. We didn't talk. Eight months later, he calls me. Hey, how are you? Like, what are you doing? He's like, I know you're doing something. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, starting capital raise. I just bought this, you know, did my whole thing and just told him where I was. And I was like, he's like, you want to hang out on Sunday? I'm like, sure. He walks into my apartment, sits down on my couch and says, I've decided that I'm going to invest in your company and I'm going to give you $250,000. What the fuck? (laughs) Like I was freaking out, freaking out. It literally walked in my front door. I wasn't like asking him for money. I was just like telling him what I was working on. Like, well, just doing the stuff. It walked in my door. And then on top of that, he signed up for, (laughs) (laughs) he signed up for six months of coaching with me. So. Yeah. Right. So I, I agree with the full body. <laughs> yes. And I, I think the more attuned you are, the more those types of moments begin to happen. My, I want to like, be very clear on like, not everything you do is going to feel like a full body. Yes. Mm-hmm. And those things still need to get done. Yes. Cause my fear is that someone will hear that and will say like, well, yeah, but it doesn't feel like a full body. Yes. Therefore I shouldn't do it. Yeah. No, you still have to do this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, so, uh, they're not a full body. Yes, but they have to get done. <laughs> yeah. Still. <a> yes. <laughs> so, um, how, yeah. How do you, I think it's what? overarching. It's overarching who you are. Mm-hmm. And it's overarching how you show up. Those are where you make your full body yes decisions. And like, when you take on massive tasks, like the walk, like this real estate deal, like, you know, your whole body knows the answer Mm -hmm. and your whole body knows the no. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't listen to the no and we push and we push and it doesn't work because we're not listening to our intuition and we're not aligned with whatever we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. I feel that. You made me think of something, the yeses and the nos. Um, it seems like the full body yeses also come when you're making next level jumps. Mm-hmm. You know, like the walk for me was something so outside my physical f- feet that I've never, I've never done. You've never done this real estate thing. I think people listening are probably thinking about moments when they've never done something, but then they ended up doing it. But the reason why they did it is because they initially had that full body. Yes. That gave them the, the right amount of energy, clarity, whatever you want to call it to get to that level. So maybe these full body yeses aren't something that you experience every day, but they come 
when you're contemplating or when you're ready to level up to whatever that next thing is like really being attuned even more in those types of moments. Yeah. I think it's, you have to be ready. Yeah. You have to be ready or you're going to not going to get it. And so it might not come like the answer might not come to you in that immediate moment. Like you said, you might have to think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, something might have to shift inside of you for it to be a full body. Yes. You might have to circle back to that. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to happen right at that moment in time. I think the more you practice in alignment, the more you practice your intention, the more clear you are when you show how you show up, you start to get a little bit more skillful in that space, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can do, you can, you can make those decisions and, and be very aware faster. But I think at the beginning, it's a learning curve. Yeah. Because you're not used to coming from that space. You know, you're used to the old programming. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even feel right because you're questioning yourself. You're questioning your ability to make that type of decision. So there's going to be friction. Right, right. How has your goal setting changed over the years? That is a really good question. Um, and I, I'm not one to say something like this, but I have not made any goals. I know. Isn't that weird? Like I, I hardly don't make goals anymore either, but I ha I ha- have them, but I just don't make it. So let's talk about this. Let's talk through this. Cause I think this okay. is really important. I feel like a lot of people out there, uh, there's a lot of philosophies, a lot of perspectives on goal setting mm-hmm. and I think both you and I both can agree that goals are important and that's just how our brains are wired. So we're always going to have one, whether we say it out loud or we write it or not, but how do you view it? Like how at, at the beginning of the year, do you have like a, a, a vision? Uh, do you break that down into smaller things that you got to do throughout the week? Like, how do you, where are you at with that? I, I'm in a weird space with this and this is, (laughs) this isn't something, something very new for me. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I, you know, I was very much like a quarterly or a, a biannual goal person, you know, I mm-hmm. would, whether it was financial and then, you know, vacation wise or trips or like spiritual journeys, like I would kind of lump it together, like middle of the year, like kind of where do I want to go for the, re- the rest of the year? I don't do that anymore at all. Mm-hmm. And it's been such a a shift for me the past two years that I've quantum leapt, like, like I've a hundred X, you know? And so, and I'm, I'm so clear that I have to be very careful on what I say out loud, because if I speak something, it comes into existence. (laughs) And I, I know that sounds insane, but it's been happening so much that I literally have to be very, very careful what I ask for Mm -hmm. and be very sure of what I actually want before I speak it because it will happen. And so like, I really believe in goal setting, but at the same time, I'm in a place where I don't want to goal set at all because I'm, I'm like just crazy shot out of a cannon because the goal represents something that you may be setting yourself too low. lower to low. Yeah. Like, yeah. like if you told me last year, what happened, what would happen this year? I would have, I would have said you're insane. Like yeah, this wouldn't even be on my goal list. Yeah. But the, but the, the development was right. Yeah, the development was to own a, to own your own development somewhere was the goal. But yep. there was no timeline. There was no like, this is how it has to happen. Nope. This is who I need to meet. Mm-hmm. It was just, this is what I want. It was, this is what I want. And then it was putting myself in, in leadership containers. Okay. And, and being very aware of when to give myself space and when to push. Because I'm, I was pushing, pushing, pushing. I'm a pusher. Like, I'm an overachiever. I have been my whole life. 
more, mm-hmm. and more, and more, more, and then more. So now I was like on this other journey of like healing shame and and healing trauma. And mm-hmm. I thought when I approached that, like I remember like my first therapy session when Doug after Doug's suicide, I was like, okay, how long is this gonna take? Like like five weeks? Just like <laughs> like sit down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I like five years at this point. She don't yeah. stop talking. <laughs> I know. And then she started talking about my relationship with my parents, and I realized I was never leaving her office. <laughs> <laughs> so so like that's how I approached it. And so I was in a space where like I didn't know what I was doing. It wasn't like I was getting another degree that I had a four-year program. Like yeah, I was in uncharted territory. And so I knew that I needed like community to support me. And I needed to keep leveling myself up. And so when I first came out of Peru, I threw myself from container after container and I realized that was too much. Like I needed to give myself some space to like process what had actually happened. And then I gave myself space and then I put myself into a 108 day leadership program in Austin. And after that, I was like, I'm good for a bit. I gave myself space to like really see and feel and like be. And then we went back to Peru. And in between all of that being is when I like hired a coach, you know, like all that started happening. And so it's like, it's almost like I'm realizing like I need to push when the universe is open and I need to rest when it's closed. And it's on me to, to make the decision on when that is correct. What are you feeling for <clears throat> to know whether it's open or closed? I'm feeling for how things are showing up for me and how I'm showing up and the friction that is happening with what I'm trying to accomplish. So give me, give me like an example of something every day that you do that is an example of like, this is probably a sign that I need to just rest for a little bit. Maybe that's a couple of days. Maybe that's a week. Well, my body's, my body is the red flag central. Cool. So my body will tell me immediately, you know, if I need to rest. And so I, I have started listening to that or, and if I don't, it like shuts me down for like a month. So really being in tune with my mind and body alignment and then also if there's friction in what I'm trying to accomplish, if I'm, mm. if I'm pushing and I'm not getting anywhere and I'm not getting response and I'm not getting like where I want to go, I have to figure out how am I showing up here? What is my intention? What is the response? And why am I not feeling like I'm not getting anywhere? Is it me? Am I pushing too hard? Is this person not being accountable for what they said they were going to do it? Does this partnership partnership not align do i need to pull back Mm -hmm. where is this just not working Mm -hmm. and a lot of things have fallen off yeah so the goal is let's just say the development you realize that community is important so you're finding a community to place yourself in that one nurtures you challenges you do you speak about that goal in those communities? I don't really speak about goals anymore. Okay. So it's something that you have that maybe people know if they ask, but otherwise it's, you're keeping it to yourself. Yes. Right now I'm keep, I'm, I'm keeping it to myself unless I'm ready for it to happen. Okay. But w- let's, so let's say you are ready for it to happen. Do you, how do you tell people regularly? Yes. I tell people. So they hold me accountable for what's happening. Okay. And it's a line though. You have to find the line between sharing too much your intention of like, why are you sharing this? Like, am I sharing this to like boast or am I sharing this for accountability? Mm -hmm. Like if I know that I'm a self-sabotager, I'm doing it for accountability. So like, you know, James, like I'm going to do this, like, make me accountable for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just got accepted to do a Ted talk yesterday. 
and I sent the acceptance out to you, to a couple of my friends, because I still haven't responded that I'm going to do it yet. (laughs) You are going to do it. (laughs) I'm totally going to do it. But like, it makes me want to throw up. Like it's way out of my comfort zone and it is a huge stretch for me. And so that went out, like I've been talking about doing this. I got accepted and, and my friends know that I have to send that email. So there's no way I'm wiggling out of this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unless I want the army to come for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that was another goal of yours, but again, not on any timeline. Yep. And you told your community mm-hmm. while you were working on yourself in the, in the form of having a coach, your own personal development that you would do on your own, and then whatever growth that you would have in your communities. Yep. Okay. That's exactly how it happened. And so I think that that's helpful on the daily, knowing that you know where you're going. So that vision is clear of, of development. Mm-hmm. How do you view that quote unquote goal in a daily format? Like are, are your to do items or is your day structured around that goal heavily? Or is it more so like I have an, a general idea of the behaviors and the activities that are going to get me closer to that goal. And then we just focus on those and see where they take me. Well, I, I work on a rapid planning method. So okay. let's use Ted as an example. You know, mm-hmm. one of the, one of the steps to this planning method was I need to hire um, a team of people who, you know, consult in creating Ted talks, you know, they've created multiple Ted talks. They, they're aware of the process and they like really support you in, you know, the application process, the creating your, you know, your talk, the whole deal from the front to the back. So that was part of it. And then, so how that works through, like that's a daily, you know, meetings, however their process goes, hiring them, like what bullet points need to get done in order to get that done. And then there's the process of the applications. So hiring a VA to, you know, apply to all of the TEDs that exist in the world and then going through that process. So I'm not doing each single like item on the checklist. And a lot of my learning has been, I don't have to do everything. I have to delegate. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, took, it took me a long time to understand that because I'm a doer. And the less doing that I was, that I'm doing, <laughs> The, and the more being who I am, the more things have been attracted to me. And it's, I'm, I'm so much more out of like the consistent doing and the pressure of accomplishing the task that I can like lean into yeah. my alignment and being clear on the goals I'm trying to accomplish. It also sounds like because you know your natural self-sabotaging tendencies that by hiring people to do it and delegating that to them helps you not get into the busyness. It keeps you accountable to making that thing happen because someone else has being paid to do it. So the likelihood of it getting done is really, really high. Yep. Uh, and then when it happens now you're almost forced to, to do it because it it is done as opposed to it being on your long list of to-do items and it never getting done because of your, um, reasons of, oh, I have so much to do. I'll get to it later. Yeah. Everything else becomes more important than the most important thing Yeah, that I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So you do have, you do have a formula. Yeah. It's just not as uh, maybe self-helpy as, as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as self-helpy. <laughs> a lot of delegating. Yeah. A lot of delegating. Okay. Anything else you want to add on that? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about self-worth uh, and how you view that and how someone can cultivate deeper levels of that. Self-worth is the most important thing that you can have. It is the driver of every decision that you make. Uh, It is the definition of who you are. 
It, it runs your subconscious. It is the boss of you, actually, <laughs> like in every way, shape or form. And we don't even re realize it. We, we have no idea that that's actually running our subconscious mind. And growing up the way that I grew up, I, I did not grow up in a healthy home, a loving home. And I didn't even realize I didn't have any self-worth. Um, I had been driving myself to prove my whole life. And I had done that in an overachieving stance. And there was no doubt that whatever was going to happen, I was going to do it well. But I was doing that from a place of acceptance and love and, and seeking validation. And I didn't even know that. And I was very fortunate enough to, you know, when, when everything happened and I had to address the suicide, I was forced to address this issue. Mm -hmm. And I was forced to look at my relationship with my parents and everything comes from childhood, you know? Mm -hmm. And so whether I wanted to or not, I was going to sit in that fire. And so through that process, I really started to, to do the work with self-worth and worthiness. And I realized it's power and I realized the power it had over me um, and everybody else. And I, and it's, you know, we see, we see worthiness in everyone and how they show up. Um, and it wasn't until I had that click. And when I saw it in myself, in the fifth leadership program that I was in, you know, I couldn't ignore it anymore. And I, I tried to hide in it. I tried to do all the things that I've done. And, you know, there was one week, first week, captain's week, and I couldn't ignore it anymore. And I, I had to look at the changes I was creating in other people. And it was every day I kept seeing it and I kept seeing it and I kept seeing it. And then in that process, I got really sick um, and I had to shut down for two weeks, like no phone, no email no work. And, and I was one year into my real estate business and I had one of the biggest profit margins on the line and the house was supposed to go up for sale. And this was like during the time that I was sick. And I had built this company to run on its own so that I could be speaking. But I had been so embedded in the doing of it because it was such a big profit margin. It was, you know, all the things all the excuses that kept me involved in the day-to-day -day and kept me overwhelmed in the day-to-day -day, that I hadn't been focusing on the speaking. And it was when I got sick for those two weeks and I came out of that, I saw that everything was fine. And I saw that I had built the company to do the thing, but I wasn't letting it do the thing because I was controlling it. And it took those two things happening for me to realize that I did it. And I did it within eight months. And that I was enough. <clears throat> so how does someone, is what I'm hearing there slowing down or pausing enough to realize that what you have done and how you have done it and realize that that was you who did it yes and and understanding more of those moments in your own life so that your self-worth becomes validated by the work that you have done and that you'll continue to do because you have a formula for getting things done in that way yes Okay. And that even if that didn't work, I was enough. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I built something from nothing, like this was an idea that mm -hmm. I said out loud the year before. 
it was a concept that I wrote down and I told my friends I was going to do, and then I did it. Like that was like, holy shit. Like this wasn't a thing. I made a thing and now it makes money. And I was like, what am I doing here? Like, what, what am I questioning anymore? Like, how many more times do I need to see this? Like, how many more companies do I need to build? How many more jobs do I need to take? How many more clients do I need to shift? Like, how many more hikes up Rainbow Mountain do I need to make? Like, how many more times do I have to sit in, in an ayahuasca ceremony? Like, how much more do I need to see before I get it? Like. I have the answers. I don't need to search for them anywhere else but with inside of me. And I'm okay with whatever those answers are because they're coming from a space of complete alignment. And my mm -hmm. intention is very clear in how I want to show up in the world. And so I'm coming from that space, which I, I feel strongly what you just described as well that you know finding my own answers i think that's the way to 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 live a, a fantastic life and, and that actually helps with comparison you know that naturally we compare ourselves in many different ways but one of them is is through style you know like we see other things that people do and we're like oh, i should do it like that no well you should do it like you that's when you're yeah. that's where you're going to do it your best when someone gets to that point where they, they, they're like, yeah, I don't have to do more of whatever it is that I think I need to do to get the answers or to find out that I am worthy and that I am enough at that point, how does one think about, or how do you think about a coach or help at that point compared to not getting to that self-worth worthy phase and getting help from a coach or anyone else? I think that everyone needs to invest in themselves mm -hmm. because there's a million zillion reasons. And I, you know, we don't have seven hours to go through them, but the most important thing I think is there's this moment in time where you wake up and you can't believe that your life is real because you're filled with so much joy and love for yourself, that you have gratitude to be able to get up and do the things that you get to do, that you get paid to do. And everyone should feel that feeling. Every single person should feel so much joy for themselves. I mean, I think that's the main reason we can go mm -hmm. through like the expansiveness and mm -hmm. the accountability and all that. But like, when it comes down to it, like this feeling that you get, it's, I can't even, I can't even describe it. Yeah. I, how I'm thinking about it is when an individual goes through enough leadership trainings, enough ayahuasca ceremonies, enough fill in the blank. And they're like, I, I understand that at some point I'm going to need to say I am my own guru, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think that people, when they get there, that the learning doesn't stop, but the validation that you're seeking in those moments does. Yes. That's what I was trying to drill home. And to ask for another leadership training or, uh, or a coach or whatever, it's not coming from the same place as it once did. Right. A main reason you went into those things was to look for answers. Whereas now you go into those things looking for a collaboration. You yeah. know the gifts that you bring, you know the value that you have, you know where your strengths and your weaknesses are. You bring those to the situation and the person that you're specifically reaching out to because of a certain skill set that you know they possess, you both can, can now can create magic with no insecurities or hardly any insecurities um, that then speeds up the time in which it takes to achieve said goal. Yes, 100%. Cool. 
And once you come into that space that you're speaking of, hold on, mm -hmm. <laughs> hold on, because it, you're going to be shot out of a cannon. And there was a process for me. I didn't get it. I didn't ever do it. So how would I understand the feeling? But I had to start feeling the, the positive feelings of the goals I was trying to achieve when I started speaking them. So with this TED talk, right? Like for weeks, I've been thinking about receiving this letter and getting accepted and, and I'm training my body to feel the joy instead of to feel the concern, the worry, the stress, I'm feeling the joy of achieving the goal. And it takes, it like shifts the paradigm of the quantum leap. It's not mm -hmm. so quantum, it's quantum in reality, but it's not so quantum in your body. Mm -hmm. It's like, you already know what this is gonna feel like. Right, and that feeling in the body shifts the thinking in the mind, which reinforces the identity that then attracts more opportunities that bring that goal closer. Yep. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we wind down here, what are some last minute words or s examples or quotes or statements that you think are really helpful for someone who has gone on this journey with us in this conversation to hear and walk away with? Invest in yourself. Invest in yourself until it makes you want to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> And whatever is causing tension or whatever you fear, lean into that. Wherever you're feeling resistance, lean into that because that's where you need to do the work. That's it. It's beautiful. Keep shining your light, D. Thank you. I can't wait to watch the TED Talk. Can't wait to hear all the upgrades and new uh, cool stories that are to come in the months and years following this episode. Um, and for you guys who uh, want to connect with Diamandia, Instagram is the best place. I'll link that in the show notes. It's not hard to find. There's very few people out there named Diamandia, so it uh, <laughs> won't be too difficult for you. Plus, go listen back to those two episodes. Uh, worth it every minute uh, to really understand the words that that D is saying and, and the potency that it comes from. If you didn't feel it, you'll definitely understand it after you listen to those episodes. Um, yeah. Anything else, D? No, I'm great. Thank you. Okay. So All right. Much love, everybody. Go do something that makes you want to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you soon. <laughs>